Hey, it's Mike here, and today my response to neuroscientist, podcaster, Andrew Huberman, who once again makes some dietary claims that I personally don't agree with, and I don't think that the literature matches up with, and his guest, a nutrition scientist by the name of Alan Aragon, does respond and refute some of those, respectfully schooling him. Man, this is a lightning rod of a the topic here. And that is on the episode, How to Lose Fat and Gain Muscle, which has done quite well. It has about a half a million views already, outperforming similar videos of his. And Aragon responds with science to some of the claims, such as the idea that vegan or plant-based protein is inferior. I feel like animal proteins are superior, but tell me, tell me what the data say. And even though I agree with a lot of what Alan is saying, there's some parts that I even have to respond to with him as well. And anyway, Huberman's a massive channel with 7 million subscribers. So we got to respond. Let's just go. First, I'll just say that Alan Aragon, again, a nutrition researcher, has a ton of peer-reviewed research that he's co-authored about 30 publications on nutrition and fitness. For example, this meta-analysis on protein timing for muscle growth. So this guy definitely knows his protein stuff. And if you're like me and just want to know the finding of that study, they say that their results refute the commonly held belief that the timing of protein intake in and around a training session is critical to muscular adaptation, saying, no, you just have to get enough. And I just want to say, shout Shout out to YouTuber Natalie Fulton, who covered this recently as well. And I didn't watch her whole video, so I'm trying not to just repeat everything she says and think for myself. But yeah, thanks to her for bringing this to my attention. And I will say, Andrew Huberman, he's been embroiled in a little bit of scandal, but I still view him as somebody that you can learn a lot from. There's a lot of good neuroscience related aspects. And he's not perfect by any means. None of us are. I still say verse instead of verses in like almost every single video. And there's some things like The Guardian saying that him talking about his lab at Stanford, you know, isn't really a lab. Some things have been stretched here and there. He might misapply some animal research, but by and large, he's more scientific than 99% of other videos available on YouTube. So there's that. And in the past, I did criticize him for his claim about butter, which he is now saying in this video was really just a joke, but he said he loves butter and he just puts hats on everything throughout of the day. Frankly, how big the podcast was going to grow to. I made a joke about like, I eat slabs of butter to increase my cholesterol. So higher testosterone, like, and then did I pay for that one? And he was justifying it by saying that the brain has cholesterol. And oh, maybe it was a joke, but it was a joke delivered in the exact same tone as all of the rest of his facts. So I don't know. He said it was early days and now says that that was probably not a good thing to say. So there's at least some progress, but it's funny because in a follow-up video, he said people were freaking out about his butter claim and then put the thumbnail to my video in it. But yeah, they do touch on that butter talk. Topic, and Alan does echo things that I've said. When you look at the effects of seed oil that are examined in the literature for various outcomes, you know, everything from the intermediate outcomes like biomarker effects, all the way to the, in quotes, hard endpoints like mortality, heart attack, you know, um, cardiac events and heart disease. So the hard endpoints, as well as the intermediate or soft endpoints, they're all superior with the seed oils compared to butter, um, lard, beef tallow. And as a specific reminder from this study on over 500,000 people, each tablespoon of butter increased mortality by 7%. And yeah, it just happens to be that a pat is about a tablespoon. So just to put things into context, but we can just move on to the main topic at hand here, which is some sort of interesting protein claims. About 39 minutes into the two and a half hour long podcast, Huberman says this. The hierarchy of protein quality. I, frankly, I've grown tired and slightly irritated at the oh, you know, these plant-based foods have a ton of quality protein in them. And I go, really? You have to consume 2,000 calories of that plant or grain in order to get the equivalent amino acid profile uh, from, you know, a four ounce piece of steak. For so it kind of gives a vibe. Anytime he sees plant protein advertised, he gets a little bit frustrated. Why would that happen? I don't know. But he is sponsored by Maui Nui, which is Peter Atia's processed deer sticks, which have a ton of sodium, side point. But to respond to his claim in particular, yeah, there might be people making poor claims about plant foods being sources of protein, like obviously orange juice isn't. But one that I love eating is black beans. And we can just look at 2000 calories of black bean at 135 grams of protein and slam between 300 to 600% of your daily value of every essential amino acid. We can compare that to four ounces of steak. And yeah, maybe he was just sort of joking a little bit again, but you know, depending on fat eaten or not eaten, we're talking about 30 to 34 grams of protein and obviously way less total essential amino acid. And you can do this for 2000 calories of a ton of different plant-based protein sources that people rely 
rely on. But yeah, it just has to be a real protein source. I could compare beans to butter and say animal-based foods don't have protein. Like, obviously that's not fair. You're getting the point. I think of protein quality in terms of quality of protein, meaning the type and ratios of amino acids, the availability of those amino acids relative to the amount of calories one has to ingest to get them. And this is not an argument that animal proteins are better ethically. I'm just saying at, at a quality as a function of calories ingested, I feel like animal proteins are superior, but tell me tell me what the data say. So he says that he feels like animal proteins are superior. This has been the conventional view and he's gonna respond to it, but he also mentioned there, he's not saying it's more ethical. So, you know, at least he's admitting that because obviously the amount of animal deaths per bite of protein is going to be lower for plant-based products. I know people love to refute that, but when he's talking about superiority, he's talking about in terms of benefits per calorie ingested. And I will just say, we're about to get into all of the muscle stuff here, but a huge benefit right off the bat is mortality. And we can see over and over again that the mortality risk is lower for plant-based compared to animal protein. So I think in that sense, it's superior. And then in terms of the risk of like getting extra calories and things like that, the extra stuff that you're getting with these plant proteins, often fiber, antioxidants, et cetera, are great for you. And now for a little tangent rant on BMI, I do notice that every time I mention BMI, people go, BMI. BMI is inaccurate and I am mentioning it in like a population study type way, but yes, individually, there's so much more to it. And that brings me to the Hume body pod. You know, you're not just hopping on a scale and getting your weight, which would give you your BMI. You are getting a body analysis with eight points of contact, four here and four here. And that gives you 98% of the accuracy of a medical grade scan. And it's a measuring a ton of things such as even limb by limb ratios of muscle and fat, as well as visceral fat and skeletal mass. I'm happy to see that my skeletal mass is high, even as a vegan. I've been told that I would have bird bones. Apparently that's not the case. And since I talk about it a lot, you know, I'm particularly concerned about visceral fat. This measures that, which is great because that's a disease risk issue. And I've been measuring this for months and I recently did my first report after about four months. And we can see that things are moving in the right direction in terms of muscle mass, fat mass, et cetera. And I do have to give this credit because it's making me think about what I'm doing for exercise and what I'm doing to change my body composition or at least keep it good. But you got that report in other ways the app is useful like AI Insights. If you are interested in this, you can of course click the link below and you can stack my my code Mike the Vegan to get up to 50% off. Only valid for seven days, but it is FSA slash HSA eligible if you're in the US, so it can be covered that way. All right. And let's get to Alan's response here. He's clearly not a vegan, but he doesn't seem to be anti plant based protein but he seems to know that saying anything positive about plant-based protein is gonna trigger some bro podcast viewers for sure in this manosphere, which Huberman is clearly part of with like 90% male guests, but here he is. Gram for gram. As a group, animal proteins are higher quality. They're more anabolic. They have a higher proportion of essential amino acids. They have a higher amount and proportion of the anabolic driving, the most anabolic driving amino acids, the branch chain amino acids, leucine specifically. And uh, in, in the majority of the literature, when you compare animal versus plant proteins head to head, you see greater muscle protein synthesis. So that's it then. Vegan diets are just worse for muscle. They both agree. Uh, we can just stop this. Uh, no. no, as he says, he's talking about it structurally, but then also we have these short term studies that don't reflect actual muscle growth in real life, which is not just one meal long. We live for multiple days and years. But okay, so the interesting part. We finally have studies where we're looking at completely vegan regimen, a, a, a group who's totally vegan, no, no animal products at all in, in the diet versus an omnivore group and uh, put them on a resistance training regimen, 12 weeks. They optimized protein or at least made it at the bottom of optimal at 1.6 grams per kilogram of body weight per day in both groups. So there were no significant differences between groups in muscle size and strength gains by the end of 12 weeks where they were put on a progressive resistance training program. It turns out there's this new AI technology that actually scans the thoughts of people mid interview. And here's what it found for Huberman. Man, this guy's really lost it with the whole plant protein thing. I, th I think we should maybe just stop filming. See, he's mentioned a study where you take vegans who have been vegan already and you take people who are on a meat-based diet and you just make sure that the vegans are getting 
a certain amount of protein and the results are the same in terms of muscle gains. And then he also sort of tangentially adds a study, which does go back to those short-term types of studies where they compared pea protein. Interesting thing about <laughs> pea protein, it actually outperformed whey in one study. So mm -hmm. in this 2015 study where um, pea protein supplementation outperformed whey for increasing muscle thickness. It was really sad. It was, I was really sad to see that because I was weighing it up and I was like, oh God, yeah. No, well, what, what are we doing what here? It is. But for that actual study on vegans, how much protein was it? It was 0.7 grams per pound of body weight, which at 180 pounds like me, that would be about 125 grams of protein. They didn't have a slightly lower protein group to compare. So we don't know where the actual cutoff would be. But this is funny because it seems like Huberman gets a little like, oh, let's move on from this. I don't know if you want to say uncomfortable or whatever, but Alan just wants to keep on nailing the point home. And even, even better would be to get great sleep and train. But I, um, I know you're, you're gearing up to, to hit, hit the next thing. I, I want to mention that this study I just talked about was not a one-off. A couple years later, Montine and colleagues did the same thing, but they used mycoprotein for the vegan group. Mycoprotein. It's a fungus-based protein. <laughs> Yeah, he was referring to this 2023 study, and it was the case that despite the researchers reporting no difference, there actually was a statistically significant difference where that vegan group had a higher gain in terms of the inclined bench, which was statistically significant. And by the end of the study, I believe it was a 12-week study, no differences, no significant differences in increases in muscle size and strength. And they you know, progressive resistance training regimen. Oh, once again, not necessarily highly trained people. And this is where I thought it was interesting that Huberman didn't know what mycoprotein was. Mycoprotein. It's, you know, maybe this is kind of niche. Not everybody is supposed to know everything, but this is a fungi based protein in case you didn't know. And it is sold often as corn, but there are a bunch of other companies that make it to some capacity. For example, we have Enough, Mycorena, Mycovation, and even Tyson and General Mills have gotten in on the action. And yeah, to put my Myco the vegan hat on and add even more facts, it was discovered in 1960 and has been on shelves since the mid 80s. So it's been around. I also had to laugh when Alan made <laughs> a Myco protein joke about Last of Us, which is of course, where a fungi turns people into zombies and you know, Huberman just wasn't familiar with it. So you've seen that, that, um, mm -hmm. that, that I think it's on, is it on Netflix it's, or HBO, it's The Last of Us, where that fungus makes people anabolic? <laughs> I haven't seen that. That's what this is. It's based on this. And well, I'm sure Alan didn't want to just keep rambling about plant-based protein studies for a whole two and a half hours. There were a couple studies hugely of note that I would have included talking about this, and they are both beef industry funded studies, which is really important because they were clearly going for a different result, and then they ended up publishing it anyway, perhaps from an NIH grant requirement or whatever, it's unclear. But we have this one from 2024, which to be fair, was only 24 hours long, but they particularly tried to put incomplete plant proteins up there, but they did not get outperformed by meat proteins. We even have a muscle protein synthesis chart that looks a little more favorable for those incomplete proteins, which sort of makes no sense. But I do have to mention that there is a potentially anabolic effect of fiber in terms of short chain fatty acid creation in the gut shown to boost muscle protein synthesis. And we have this Mendelian study associating that as well in women, which is fascinating. But again, because it was more than just one meal, perhaps they were able to pick up a more realistic effect. And then we also have this 2025 study that was nine days long, also beef industry funded. And they found that once again, the plant versus animal protein with resistance training found no difference. And that is a new one. It's only like four months old or something like that. So I understand why Alan might've not seen it, but yeah, we have, what is that? Like four studies now showing, you know, plant-based proteins hanging in there. Now I have to also get to where I disagree with Alan. And that was at least about his concern with collagen on a vegan diet. Multiple systematic reviews showing the benefits of, of collagen on various skin outcomes which are debated, of course. On a related note, I think that's one of the disadvantages that, that vegans might have until they find a genius way to manufacture <laughs> a non-animal collagen molecule. So he says this is where vegans could go wrong and this is where I have to disagree with them on two fronts. First of all, it is just the future now and we do have a ton of collagen peptides and those collagen peptides from double blind placebo controlled randomized trials like this one have been shown to be as effective as animal collagen in terms of those skin results. So that exists, but then we also have this very 
fascinating biological phenomenon where vegans have higher levels of glycine, which is the main amino acid that is in collagen. And that's because we have lower levels of these Bolophila bacteria that feed on a ton of bile created by eating animal fat. And in that process, they take glycine and they eat it up and then they create hydrogen sulfide and other things which are not good for colorectal cancer risk, et cetera. But yeah, from the Stanford twin experiment, if we're talking about Stanford and the Epic Oxford data, we can see that vegans have significantly, meaningfully higher levels of blood glycine. Now, so his claim, I don't think matches up with the literature. I'd love to hear his response to those data. And also I know when you guys see something in a title, you want more information related to that title. And the title of this video was about losing fat, not just about gaining muscle. So if I were to throw one insight in there, which I thought was really interesting around something that I've been concerned about or thought you need to do, and that is fasted cardio for fat loss. I've heard of a lot of people doing fasted cardio, and I thought, man, someday I'm gonna wake up early enough to do some cardio in the morning, and then I'm gonna get all shredded from losing the extra layer of fat, and that's when I'll reach peak Mike. We took college age subjects, uh, women, and we compared fasted cardio with fed cardio, no difference in body fat reduction between groups by the end of the study, whether they did their cardio fed or whether they did it fasted. And that's because we equated the total nutrition between the groups. It sort of evens out throughout the day, your body <laughs> figures that out. And then for people on the other side of the equation concerned that fasted cardio might eat up more lean mass, that was also not a result from the literature. And then finally, another really interesting discussion was, is it possible to gain muscle and lose fat at the same time? And that is something that I thought wasn't possible. I thought you had to have a huge calorie surplus to put on muscle, and then you had to have a calorie deficit to lose fat, but then, Using that Hume scale that I was talking about earlier, I saw a period where I was able to actually lose fat and gain muscle at the same time, just a little bit. And so I looked into it a bit more and yeah, as Alan even said. Is it possible to quote unquote, gain muscle while at the same time losing fat? Yes. <laughs> Great, that will be reassuring to people. Yes, the recomposition phenomenon is, I think seven out of the 10 studies was a lean mass gain dominant recomposition. So in other words, more lean mass was gained than fat was lost. And then there was one more sort of Huberman diet concern that is older that I'd never touched on that I wanna to respond to. And that is that a low saturated fat intake in your diet could lead to basically castration for men because you like can't create hormones. If you went on a low fat diet, subcaloric low fat diet is, you know, it's a form of nutritional castration basically. Yep. Right. If you increase your fat, in particular saturated fats, I, the vegan community is pretty angry with me right now because I said, <laughs> sin of all sins, I said that I, I eat butter. I like grass-fed butter. Not, I don't eat chunks of it, I eat a little bit of it. And there's a video on the internet saying, you know, he's bad advice. I, my blood lipids are great, thank you. <laughs> and dietary cholesterol is, is vital for hormone production. Mm -hmm. And for me, butter, red meat from good sources is wonderful. And there is a concern that because vegans eat less saturated fat, about half as much on average, which is great for LDL cholesterol, that they would end up with low testosterone levels. But we can see from studies like this one that vegans have equivalent free levels of testosterone and actually higher total levels of testosterone, statistically significantly from that study at least. So just another claim that he doesn't bring receipts to. And that is sort of the pattern here with diet especially. He's more likely to talk about the actual study when it's neuroscience, but if he's talking about pats of butter or he's talking about animal protein being superior or dietary castration from low fat, he doesn't seem to cite research, which is really frustrating. So yeah, I would love to have covered more of this two and a half hour discussion. And even the protein discussion was like 15 minutes long. I can't respond to every single sentence, but hopefully you enjoyed it. And let me know down below if you have anything to add or any points in there I missed in particular you wanna hear about. And of course, if you would like to try the human body pod, you could just click that link below and use the code Mike the Vegan for up to 50% off when stacked with other codes. And that's only valid for seven days. But yeah, other than that, Feel free to like and subscribe and all that good stuff. And I will say that I have done well over 500 videos now, which I've realized, which has absolutely blown my mind. So thanks for continuing to watch and supporting my channel to all of you.